we're kicking off toward Easter. That's right. Once again, we're in the Lent season. Now, I have a question this morning. Did you guys know that pretty much every year, new words are added to our dictionary? It's kind of a phenomenon, to be honest. There's so many advances in society. There's, there's new words that are needed to describe these new things, these new concepts. Actually, over the past decade, on average, Merriam-Webster has noted that they have added between 800 and 1,000 new words per year. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Words that are so regularly used now that they had to be officially recognized and added to our dictionary and to our speech. The funny thing is, is I don't know that we would all agree that these are great additions. Um, words like binge-watching, photobomb, safe space, side-eye, and one of my favorites, weak sauce. Now, a few have made it in through the years that I think are even worse than those. I want to see if maybe anybody can figure out the definitions of these before I give them to you. Here's the first one, blamestorming. Anybody have any ideas on what blamestorming means? All right, good. Put it up there, Joe. This is sitting in a group discussing who's responsible for the company's problems instead of trying to solve them. <clears throat> uh, government? Just thought. Intoxication. This intoxication is the euphoria of getting a tax refund, which lasts until you realize it was your money to begin with. Now some even more recently that have come in. Oh, you Gen Z weirdos. Okay. Simp. Simp. It means excessive devotion or longing for someone or something. Okay. Goated. Goat is, is when you're given the title of the greatest of all time. We know about this idea of being the goat. But then when you're given that title, you're being goaded. We've turned this not only from this weird thing, greatest of all time is the goat, which, come on, people, really? That's the animal we're going to use as the idea of being the greatest of all time? You know, that now they've turned it into a verb that can be actively given. I don't get it. Mid. This is another one. Mid. Some of you teachers in here, I know you're going, yep, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've heard this. Mid is not bad, not good. It's just so-so. And then there's bussin'. Oh, dear Lord. This is extremely good or excellent. Yeah, some, of the, some of the kids are just going, yeah. You know, I'm like, these are in our dictionary now. Are you serious? Of course, then you start to think back to your own generation and think about the words that you use. And you're kind of going, okay, in some respects I get it. But in other respects, I, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to use the word bussin'. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Here's the challenge for you, though. I, <laughs> I challenge some of you, see if you can slide some of these words into your conversation this week and see the reactions that you get. Oh, man, yeah, I'd love it. Maybe on Saturday when we're at the men's thing, Mike will talk about how bussin' the Word of God is. So, <clears throat> now, words are fun. Words are fun. They give us a different way of looking at things, of interacting with the world. They, the problem is that on the flip side, there are words that we tend not to pay very close attention to. Words that have actually been around forever, to be honest. Many of these have been around for, for centuries and centuries, a very, very long time. And when it comes to familiar words with familiar meanings, a lot of times we tend to overlook them. We tend not to pay attention to them. Honestly, a lot of us, we just see it or say it, and we just assume that we fully understand what it means. But in this series, we're going to approach one particular word like maybe we've never heard it before. We're going to set aside the previous thought of what that word was. We're going to try to hear it new. Because while familiar to us, I think a lot of times we miss the power of it. So in this series, we want to get a deeper knowledge of that word, and that word, that probably you probably guessed from what's on the screen, is grace. We're going to take a whole new approach to the word grace. 
In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Some of the more popular translations say, misses out. See to it that nobody misses out on the grace of God. And this is a responsibility that we've been given. If we've received that grace, we need to be showing, giving, talking about, representing, and introducing others to that same grace that we have. I mean, let's be honest. In life, there's other things that are okay to miss out on. There are things you're going to miss out on. It's okay if you miss out on them. One thing I desperately have still wanted to do in my life is go skydiving. I'm going to miss out on that because my wife will kill me if the skydiving doesn't. But the one thing you don't want to miss out on is God's amazing grace. Grace makes a difference in our lives when it's missed when it's not present, when it's removed or when it's replaced, that's a really bad thing. We need to clearly understand grace. This is vitally important. And that means that we actually have to take a side note here and we have to talk about another word. We have to talk about the word sin. Because you can't talk about grace without talking about sin. And unfortunately, this is a major culture shift because I told you, you know, it makes a difference when it's missed, when it's removed, you know, our culture wants to remove this or replace it. They want to replace it with something else. Today's idea is not to talk about grace or sin, but just talk about love and tolerance. But we have to talk about sin. They go hand in hand. There's no way of getting around this. You can't talk about Jesus being the Savior without talking about what he saved us from. And it may seem, you know, that... that Honestly, sin may be another word that we have to reconsider the definition of. And to some, this may seem archaic, that it's only used by people who are in the church. Okay, great. It's not. Because any sort of criminal activity is, is sin. So maybe we consider this simple definition. We change it over and we say this. Sin is choosing God's way, or choosing my way, over God's way. It's choosing my way over God's way. Or as James put it, anyone that knows the good that he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. But the Bible talks about the sin problem. Paul breaks this down so beautifully in the book of Romans. In chapter 3, verse 23, a verse that I'm sure many of us are familiar with, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's a big word in there. A big word. It's only three letters. All. All. And I'm not talking about the 1980s detergent here, okay? I am talking about every single person that's ever existed for all time, for all eternity. We've all done it. There's no denying it. We've chosen our way over God's much, much better way at points in our life, which means we've sinned. Everyone. No one's without it. The way that we try to get around this in justification, though, is we play that comparison game. You know, that game where it's like, oh, you know, I know I'm a sinner, lowercase, but that person, they're a <laughs> sinner, you know, uppercase. If you're typing this out, you know, you're, the, you're just a sinner. They're the sinner. I might do this, but they do that. We compare as if that's what God does with us. That's absolutely a 180 degree backwards thinking. We do. We tend to look at it like we're looking at a skyline. We see these levels in which sin exists. God sees a bird's eye view, guys. It is on an equal level playing field. It really doesn't matter what it is. Sin is sin is sin. The funny part is, is when we do this, when we compare, what, what are we doing when we compare ourselves to others and we compare our sins to each, to each other? <laughs> we're sinning! <laughs> It's a big slap in the face. Why is it that we're doing that? Easy. Pride. Pride. And most oftentimes that pride is uglier than probably the sin that we are trying to make ourselves feel superior to. This is why the first step toward understanding grace is actually understanding and being willing to admit the sin in our own lives. How many of you say, oh, that's easy, I have no problem admitting the sin in my life? Right, show of hands. Okay, there's a couple of people, all right. 
Next week, we'll talk about humility. Um, <clears throat> admitting it really isn't easy for most people. Now, let me ask you this. <laughs> and don't go nudging the person next to you. Like, actually, be honest about this one. How many of you are stubborn at admitting when you're sick? Going, I am not, I'm not going to, like, nope, I'm not sick, I'm fine. Okay, I'm in that boat. Why is it that we do that? Why are we so stubborn to admit when we're sick? See, if we acknowledge that we're sick, it requires us to change. It requires us to do something about it. So when we pretend that we're not sick, we're creating a bigger problem because that's not a very effective way for us to get over the sickness. We have to acknowledge the sickness, understand and discover what it is, so that we can do what's needed in order to get better. The same thing exists with the sin in our lives. When we choose to acknowledge our own sin, we can start to look for a way that's better. We can start to look for a way to overcome it. We can start to look to a way to battle against it. And grace, in its own way, shape, and form, as a cure for this, means nothing if we don't choose to first recognize the sickness that's within us. Romans 3.23 said, we've all sinned. We're all sinners. And a few chapters later in 6.23, it says that the wages of that is death. We're all sinners, and the sin that's in our lives means it's over. We're all sinners. Penalty for being sinners is death. And that death is not just this physical idea here. What we're talking about is a spiritual death. And the spiritual death means an eternity without God. That's just plain and simply bad news. It's just bad news. We don't want to hear that. It's a virus of sorts. And it's been spread all over this world to every person. And it's a sin nature that is stuck deep with each and, within each and every one of us, all born with it. And left to our own strength and to our own abilities to try to figure that out. Guys, we're goners. We're goners. And the Apostle Paul talks about where it all began. Where it came from to begin with. Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man... And death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. That big three-letter word is plastered in there again. All men because all sin came into the world through one man. It's a clear picture. It's destructive. There is a severity when it comes to sin. We're all sinners deserving that death sentence. Not the physical nature, necessarily. I mean, yeah, we're going to die. It's a part of it. But spiritually speaking, eternal souls deserving separation from God for all eternity. Now imagine for a moment if that's where it was left. That's it. That's the end of it. Hopelessness, despair, nothing else. I'm so glad that a few verses later, Paul introduces us to grace. An antidote for that infection and that virus. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Let me summarize. Adam done knocked us down, but Jesus done picked us up. Sin is great. God's grace is greater. That's the equation that Paul presents. He's drawing this equation for us. Grace is greater than anything that we can put on the other side. Whatever sin, whatever mistakes, whatever regrets, whatever events you wish never happened in your life, grace is greater. It provides us a freedom and a hope that is greater than just fill in the blank. No matter what you've done, the consequences of your sin, grace can be greater than all of it. And Paul explains that vast difference between the consequences of sin and grace. He goes on. The result of God's gracious gift is very different. 
from the result of that one man's sin. I.e., they're opposites, absolute opposites. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads us to our being made right with God. For the sin of this one man caused death. But even greater is God's wonderful grace. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. God's grace is greater than your sin. Don't miss that. No one should. Just like Hebrews said, make sure that no one falls short of it. No one misses out on the grace of God. In other words, that no one should miss out on the opportunity for a relationship with Jesus Christ, which makes you right with God and gives you that second chance. No one sitting in here or anywhere else for that matter is going to be able to look at me, tell me, and convince me, no, not me, what I've done is way too terrible, I will never be able to have that. But verse 18 right here says, Jesus' act of righteousness, it brings about a right relationship with God. And for who? Everybody. Everybody. That means you. That means me. <coughs> you choose Jesus. And what happens when you choose that relationship and you say, I need God, I need Jesus, I need salvation through that, then what happens is, is you get grace, you get grace, you get grace, you get grace. Everybody's getting grace. Now here's something that's kind of on the flip side of that. What happens then when the whole idea of grace doesn't exist? When culture starts to present this idea that we're going to replace this, we're going to remove this, we're going to act like this doesn't exist, do you know what you call it when you talk about God and you leave the grace part out of it? It's called religion. I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. Jesus didn't like it. You want to know how much Jesus didn't like it? Note this, Matthew 23. Just go read Matthew 23. Write that down. Go read Matthew 23. It's harsh, deeply harsh. And why was Jesus so hard on religion? Because religion was trying to replace this idea of grace, and religion is not greater than your sin. Here's the idea of a definition of religion. It's our attempt to earn God's favor by following certain rules and regulations. Why is this so dangerous? Why is it so dangerous to try and do it by our own power for certain rules and regulations? Because it leads to this mentality of, oh, I can be good enough. I do enough good deeds that the equation will end up working in my favor. But Paul's equation wasn't that your good works your good standing, your servanthood, your positive attitude, your tolerance of anybody's choices are greater than sin. No, religion's not greater than your sin. It's not an effective way to deal with our sin. The power of grace has to be experienced, and it has to be experienced through something that, hmm, this is important. In fact, this is the glue that holds this all together. It has to be experienced through repentance and that repentance comes through that relationship as paul stated christ's sacrifice offers real what relationship with god the hard and fast truth is this there's no relationship with god without repentance period back to that sickness concept here you've got to admit and you have to acknowledge what is going on John said this, if we what? Confess our sins. If we confess our sins. This is an if-then idea. This is a partnership idea. It requires us to do something, 
and God will follow through. He's made the promise. It's already there. It's real. You can trust it. But we have to do our part, and then he'll follow through on it. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You got to recognize it. You got to get the cure. You got to admit the sickness. You have to repent. You can't act like you're not sick. Back to what John said about that, too. If you act like you're not sick, oh no, I don't have any sin in my life. To claim that you're without sin is to not only fool yourself, it's to call God a liar. I don't know about you, I'm not into calling God a liar. There are significant differences that we see between this idea of religion and relationship that comes from repentance. Number one, religion says do. Religion says do. If, if I do more, if I do enough, if I work hard enough, then I'll make the cut. No. Relationship says done. Relationship says done. Because it's based on what has already been done for us. It's based on the promise of Jesus Christ. It's based on the work of his sacrifice on the cross, his death and his resurrection that was given for us. Religion says outward. You see, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He said, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. What he's saying is, hey, you look the part on the outside and you talk a big game, but inside, in here, you're dead. You're dead as a doornail. You can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. You've got to show me. That's why relationship says it's inward. It focuses on the heart. It's what happens in here. It's what the Spirit of God does to you to change you from the inside out. That transformation happens. Like Paul says in Romans 12, it's a renewing of your mind. You are transformed because your thought process begins to understand that there's a different way to do something. And so you begin to adapt your heart to God's truth. And then religion, it says rules. I, I, I'm going to make up rules that are not necessarily from Scripture. I'm going to make up rules that you have to follow. <laughs> Jordan's shaking his head. Yeah, yeah, he gets it. <laughs> we call that legalism and it exists in a lot of places in the church today this idea that oh if you're really a christian you're not just going to follow scripture but you're also going to follow this list of things that we're going to tell you you have to do to be a christian and get into heaven see and that's not how it works instead relationship says repentance Relationship says repentance, and then I'm going to cover you with my grace because relationship with God is not up in the air with every mistake and every sin that you commit when you've chosen to enter into relationship with him. When we confess it and we acknowledge it before the throne of God and we say, Jesus, I need your blood to cover this. I'm in the wrong. I've sinned against you and I need you to correct this then Jesus becomes our righteousness before the Father. Grace is greater than religion. In the New Testament, Paul is a great example of this. Here's a guy that was a Pharisee. He knew the law up one side and down the other. He went out, he killed Christians. Then he had this uh, experience, maybe you've heard of it, on the road to Damascus. And let me tell you, Paul had an instantaneous renewing of the mind. A 180 degree spin and change. Because of the recognition of what he was doing wrong and what he needed to do right. <coughs> but I think one of the most powerful examples is actually a story more focused and applied in the Old Testament with our buddy King David. And I think there's two major lessons that we glean from David in this. The first is that grace is greater than your secret. Grace is greater than your secret. See, David had a secret, and his worst fear was that it was going to be found out. See, he saw this beautiful woman bathing on a rooftop, 
And he became excited about it. And this married woman, Bathsheba, he invited her into his palace and he invited her into his bed. And what happened? He committed adultery. Not only that, <laughs> she got pregnant. And so David calls for her husband, who's on the battlefield fighting for Israel, calls Uriah home, says, you've done good, my faithful servant. You fought well. And in an attempt to cover it up, he says, you should go home. You deserve some R&R. You should go home and you should be with your wife. And Uriah comes back to him the next day and he says, all good? He says, no, my brothers are out there fighting. How can I take advantage of this and be with my wife when I know that's going on? David realizing, oh no, this isn't working, sends Uriah back out to the fight, but this time he tells his commanding officer, put him on the front lines where the fighting is the fiercest. What happens? Uriah is killed. David committed murder. You want all the details? 2 Samuel chapter 11. You know, I wonder sometimes if this is where some of us get to or where one of us might be sitting right now. Maybe we're battling with something that has to do with, with lust or, or greed or pride or selfishness within us. And we don't want our secrets to be found out. But here's the problem. That secret is what's making you sick. And you think that the worst thing is that your secret's going to be found out, but you've got to understand something. God's grace is greater than your secret. And you're not going to know that until you dig into that darkness and you bring it to light, because when it's exposed, you're going to be terrified about what's going to happen, and that's why you don't want it exposed but you're going to be met with a beautiful truth that God's grace is greater when you choose to confess and repent of that. So stop letting your secret win. If you're battling with that right now, stop. Stop letting your secret win. Bring what's in the darkness into light and discover that God's grace is greater than your secret. And in the process, you'll learn that God's grace is greater than the shame you think is going to come because of it. David was ashamed and broken when he was confronted with it. But in the midst of that, he immediately replied, relied upon the grace of God because the prophet Nathan came and confronted him on it, told him what it was, uncovered it before him, and then David said to Nathan in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, I have sinned against the Lord. Immediately, immediate confession, a brokenness. I can't believe I've done this. And Nathan's response, he said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. God's grace is greater than our sin. It's greater than the secret. It's greater than the shame you may think you feel. Yes, David had consequences. The son that Bathsheba gave birth to from the adulterous relationship died. But there was a cry of David inviting God's grace and a restoration of a relationship that came by repentance. And the most beautiful picture of this is represented in the psalm that David penned because of what occurred. Psalm 51 says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And here, here's the beauty of repentance. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. That's a thing of beauty. Unlike David, though, a lot of Christians will receive grace, but we don't choose to live in it. We continue to feel bad. We continue to feel guilt. We continue to feel 
shame over these things. Instead of living in the joy and the peace of God's grace, we don't fully follow through the way David did. You know, what's really sad is sometimes the church is deeply guilty of continuing that shame and that guilt upon those people. Well, you did this three years ago, so I'm sorry, you just don't qualify to be a part of this or that. But when confession and repentance is real, and you see that with somebody, and you've spoken about that with somebody, just as David's example here in Psalms, that's when Jesus says, you've got to stop it because I've removed their sin from them as far as the east is from the west. And when I look at that person, he says, I don't see that blemish or that defect anymore. It's gone. And the Bible says Jesus came not just to set us free from the sin. He came to set us free from the guilt of it entirely. Pastor Matt Chandler from the Village Church down in Texas, he tells this story of when he was a freshman in Bible college. He had met this young single mother named Kim, and he and his, several of his fellow Bible college students, they wanted to introduce her to their amazing God. So they invited her to come along to a Christian concert with them. And she agreed. She went along with them, and after the band had finished up, then a preacher got up on the stage. He was going to talk about the topic of sex. And it was very apparent to Matt from the beginning, this guy was really angry about this subject matter. He talked about statistics related to sexually transmitted diseases. And then he got out this beautiful rose. And he smelled it. He talked about how beautiful it was. And he threw it out into the crowd. And, and he instructed them, I want you to pass this rose around while I continue to speak. Everybody take a chance to hold it, to smell it, to enjoy it. And he continued his rampage from there. Matt recalls that he was pointing fingers and he was raising his voice and he was just directing all of this anger at this subject matter. And he remembers that he looked over at Kim at one point, this young single mom who'd come from a very rough past. And he could see that she just hung her head in shame. And towards the end of this guy's sermon, he asked for whoever had that rose to come back and, and, and bring it back to him. And when he received it, it was a mess. Half the petals were gone. It had been handled and broken. And that pleasant scent just wasn't really there anymore. And he said, you know, now who's going to want this? Nobody's going to want this. Nobody's going to want to buy this rose anymore. And here's Matt. He's sitting next to this young lady. And he said everything in him wanted to stand up and yell back at this preacher, Jesus wants that rose. Jesus bought that rose already. That's the whole point of the gospel. The one who was without sin became sin so that we could find freedom. Jesus came to take that which was ugly, broken, messed up, disgusting, what others think is ruined, and make it into something new. Jesus wants the broken rose. There's a word for that. Grace. It's grace. Grace.